Hi, I'm Marty Wall. I'm a member of the Valley Disaster Preparedness Fair planning team, and I've also been an amateur radio operator for over 50 years. Today I want to talk about what happens when disasters hit uh, to your everyday communications that you rely on. And more importantly, how can you prepare yourself for disruptions in the communication systems? When everything is okay, we don't have any disasters going. We have highly reliable phone service. We have predictable cellular phone coverage. Radio, television broadcast, cable, all going 24-7. We have steady, clean electrical power. We have high-speed internet connections home and away. And we have navigable roads and highways. The public responders, likewise, have nice, robust safety systems. Uh, they can have radio communication from, uh, say, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to their home base. The hospitals have something called ReadyNet, which is internet-based, and VMED, which is radio-based, to communicate among the hospitals. Uh, public Works and other public agencies use Part 90 radios, which are commercial radios. But still, we see things like this. After 9-11, the number of responders coming from different jurisdictions were all trying to use the same channels, and communications became unintelligible. After Katrina, failure of communications was a real roadblock to relief and rescue efforts. There was an ice storm in Kentucky, and the first thing it did was ruin their communication systems. So why does communication always seem to be an issue during a major disaster? There are really two main reasons. The first is overloaded systems. The second is infrastructure damage. Let's talk about each of those. Overload simply means there's usage more than the capacity. Just like our highways can't accommodate all the cars we have on the road at once, the telephone system can't accommodate all its users at once. That's why often in an earthquake, uh, telephone handsets get knocked off the hook, and it's just as though everybody's picking up the phone, system gets overloaded. Most cellular systems can only handle a few percent of their subscribers at any one time, and even then, they depend on the public switch landline system in order to feed the rest of the uh, signals to where they're going. Our public agencies have many more users than they have radio channels, so they use what's called trunking systems to dynamically allocate uh, radio frequencies to a user who needs it at that particular time. When you have a disaster, there's a surge in demand that can far exceed the capacity. Infrastructure damage comes in many different forms. When commercial power is lost, those communication systems that don't have battery backup are going to be down. Transmission lines can go down from trees fallen in a high wind, or from fire, or from earthquake. Microwave antennas can become misaligned. Freeway overpasses may collapse. Buildings that house key communication infrastructure can be damaged. And certain lifelines, like water, fiber optics, and so on, can be severed by the major land action of a, of a quake. Ultimately, the infrastructure may not be there when you need it. So, what can you do? First, prepare your family. Have a plan. Know what your escape routes are, what supplies you need, where they are, how you can access them. Have an out-of-state contact. This is important because you may be able to reach them either directly or through a third party that has communication capabilities, such as an amateur radio operator. If that out-of-state contact knows uh, that you're okay or what your status is, they then can convey it to your other family and friends. And then learn to use FRS radios or GMRS radios with a family license. I'll describe those in just a little bit. In addition to preparing your family, you should prepare your neighborhood. Get involved with your CERT or community emergency response teams with your neighborhood watch program. Get to know the Map Your Neighborhood program called RYLAN or Ready Your LA Neighborhood in this city. Plan and practice using FRS and GMRS radios and see if you can find local amateur radio operators or hams who may be able to help you with communication needs. So what are these FRS and GMRS radios? They're low cost, short range, UHF transceivers. That means they both transmit and receive. The FRS or family service radios are very low power and there's no license needed. The GMRS or general mobile radio service units are more powerful. They can use external antennas which can help communication. You do have to have a license, but the license is around $75. It's good for every member of your immediate family, and it lasts for 10 years. 
There are 22 channels set aside for these services. 15 of those are shared between the two, which means you can inter-communicate between FRS and GMRS, and we'll see that why that's an advantage in a moment. So these FRS handhelds work locally, maybe a few blocks. They're typically at one half to two watts of transmit power. They have an antenna that cannot be removed, that's part of the regulations, which means you can't upgrade to a better antenna. They're well suited for talking over a few blocks or maybe between stories of a building. There's no license fee, there's no exam, no nothing. These radios are inexpensive. Some of the manufacturers you may see are Midland, Uniden, Motorola, Cobra, and others. I've seen them as low as $10 each. You can get kits, which include speaker mics and chargers and so on, for $30 and up. You'll often see them sold in sets of two or more. Some of them may have some additional features, such as the ability to receive NOAA weather broadcasts. Here are some examples of what these radios look like. But you may even find radios that look like this. They may be toys to a kid, but they probably still work. Now GMRS, or General Mobile Radio Service, those can reach farther. You can have up to 50 watts on certain channels. They typically will have an external antenna, which means you can put up something at a height that will have a better view of the area and reach further. They can, as I mentioned earlier, communicate with FRS radios and, of course, with other GMRS radios. In a neighborhood situation, a GMRS station would be ideal for a command post or a base station. Because of its higher antenna, it could more easily reach those with FRS radios that are around the area. Now, if you're going to use a radio, it's a good idea to develop some basic operating skills to get the most out of them. First, learn to copy accurately, that is, listen and write down what you hear. Speak concisely and distinctly, and don't go too fast. Follow good radio procedures. You can improve your ability to hear what's going on on the radio by monitoring air traffic control frequencies. Try to write down what you hear. Monitor fire or police tactical frequencies. And again, write down what you hear. Practice converting from what you hear to getting it down on paper. It's a good idea to learn the ICAO phonetics alphabet. That's the one that's used by the military, it's used by aircraft pilots, and many services accept certain law enforcement. You can practice by using the alphabet to spell license plates, signs, and so on. Now, uh, this is the one that goes, you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and so on. Uh, each word is easily heard and will help you distinguish between an F and an S, or a P and a T, which may be confused if you just say the letters alone. Good radio procedure includes first indicating who it is you're calling, and then who you are. So, Mason Command, this is Mason Triage. Wait for an acknowledgement before starting the message. Don't call somebody and just start talking because they may not be ready to listen or ready to write it down. When you're done, simply clear the frequency, let everybody know you're finished because somebody else may need to use it. Use short, simple messages on the radio. Fewer words are better. If you're going to give numbers, such as a street address, say each digit separately, like 5514 not 5514. Have your team decide and use tactical call signs. Uh, now those are radio identifiers that are assigned to a specific team or a function or a location. They may be used in an incident, in a drill, or some sort of ongoing operation. So for example, we have Mason Command, this is Mason Fire, you use that throughout the exchange. When you're done, Mason Fire Clear. That means that's done, I'm not going to say any more on the radio, somebody else can use the frequency. When you get an FRS radio, make sure that it can take alkaline batteries, either AA or AAA. Some of them have rechargeable batteries that come with them, but if the power is out, you may have trouble recharging that radio when you need to use it. So always be able to put in uh, non-rechargeable batteries. Many of the radios come with some uh, special functions like what they call privacy tones or a beep at the end of the transmission. Those are really uh, not useful, and we always advise people to turn them off. And importantly, don't just leave the radio in a drawer once you have it and forget it. You have to use it, otherwise you won't know how to use it when the time comes. To use your radio, hold it about two inches from your mouth, angled slightly away. That will minimize the pops and hisses that would come with P and S. Press the push to talk button, which is usually located on the left side. Importantly, 
you have to let go of that button in order to listen and get the radio back to a receive mode. When you're testing with another uh, person, ask them whether your voice is too loud or too soft. Some people have naturally loud voices. Some are very soft spoken. You can adjust the distance between your, the radio and your mouth to compensate and get it to where you're easy to understand over the radio. Run radio coverage tests with your neighbors. This is a good thing to do if a neighborhood is going to use these radios for, say, a CERT program. Have somebody go around and check various locations, find the hot spots, find the dead spots. You might, for example, find out that if you're using the radio in your house, you can't be heard more than a house or two away, but if you're outside in your yard, you can be heard to the end of the block. It's a good idea to monitor and even check into some existing FRS nets. A net is simply uh, a gathering of people on a given radio channel at a given time for a particular purpose. The Lake Balboa Neighborhood Council's Emergency Preparedness Committee started a Sunday morning simplex net on FRS channel 15. It goes on at 10 o'clock every morning on Sundays and it lasts about 10 or 15 minutes. Now, your handheld radio may not be able to reach around the valley, but we have stations with GMRS radios and better antennas stationed all around the valley and they can hear you, they can relay. If they relay, they can get the information to where it needs to go. This is probably what would happen in an actual disaster. You can set up your own neighborhood net and uh, check in regularly and again, keep in practice with those radios. So why should you team up with amateur radio operators? Well, for one thing, they have a lot more frequencies that they can use. And they can certainly contact places that you can't with your FRS or GMRS radio. They can reach significant distances across the city, across the state, across the country. Many of them have training in disaster communications. If not, there are plenty of places they can get it. Amateur radio operators serve at no cost to the public. If you're already an amateur radio operator, connect with your neighbors. Get involved with their emergency communication work uh, through uh, CERT or the Neighborhood Watch program. Uh, try to join existing amateur radio networks such as Amateur Radio Emergency Service, which serves primarily the LA County Hospitals, or the Auxiliary Communication Service, which serves the City of LA and its various departments, or the Disaster Communication Service, which helps communications with the Sheriff's Department. Try to develop flexibility in your station as to how many bands and modes you can operate. Power sources, try to be able to operate independent of commercial mains. Have different antennas available for different bands and for different particular communication needs. Be field ready. Try to be able to operate away from home. And that could be in a vehicle or with something called a go kit, uh, out at a park bench, whatever it may be. Know how to reach other amateurs who are attached to first responders. You can get valuable information that way, such as whether a particular hospital is currently in a status to receive patients. And learn formal message handling through the National Traffic System or other organizations. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of the fair.